Hi, my name is Tyler Fornis, and I am the co-host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hunky here on the Voice of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Every week, my co-host Fred Moreland and I discuss all the happenings of All Elite Wrestling and everything going on in the universe of Tony Khan. We talk about Dynamite, we talk about Rampage, and we will talk about Collision when the time comes as well, along with all the appearances outside of AEW from all the best talents in all elite wrestling. This is one of the more cohesive wrestling companies in the entire world, and we discuss every intricacy about it, including the unique booking of Tony Khan that is both a huge positive and a major detriment. Check us out every single Thursday here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, as always, Jesse Collings, and joining me here for the second time for kind of like a, I don't want to call it a part two, it's more of a sequel to our previous podcast earlier this year about CM Punk. Uh, it's Trevor Dame. Trevor, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, it, it's funny because I think after we did the first one, you, I, that was like the most positive feedback I ever got from a guest appearance on someone's show. You were like, r- right after you were like, should we do a follow up the next week? Because like news kept breaking. And I was like, uh, maybe we should wait a while because I'm busy and also because wait until a bunch more stuff happened to see on Punk. But the funny thing is, I feel like you could have done probably like somebody could have done a weekly CM Punk podcast at different points during this story. Like you could have gotten seven shows out of this like a punk a punk watch podcast where you just spent like 60 minutes every week reviewing punk news you probably could you could have you could do that like between when we recorded this this the first episode in the spring to to now i feel like you definitely could have gotten away with that it's it's a it's a weird thing because like i simultaneously get fatigued while being fascinated by the punk story like there are times where i'm like i like because i have friends who will be like aren't you tired of this or i'm getting i just want this to be over and i will feel that at the same time every time i feel like i'm feeling that way some crazy twist will happen in the story i'll be like i can't help it like you still have me i i i i can't not be interested in this i was exhausted by the punk discourse but then he got fired and it kind of felt like Oh, okay. I can talk about this now again because something so significant happened, and kind of the, he, you know, he's been pushed out of AEW formally now. So it feels like we're not necessarily talking about an evolving situation anymore. So it's less exhausting. We can we can look at more of like a retrospective of his time yeah. in AEW and kind of what went wrong on his end, what went wrong on Tony Khan's end, what went wrong in AEW as a whole. We can look at that now without really having to feel with, you know, the constant speculation about what's going to happen. We're not talking about the the volcano that's about to erupt. We are now talking about the eruption itself. And that's a little bit more tolerable for me because it was turning into an extremely exhausting topic that was totally sucking up the oxygen of anything else that was happening in the company. Yeah, I mean, that that's the one thing about this. And I don't know if everyone feels this way, but... I definitely feel like in some ways, like however you feel about punk and and losing him, like I feel in some ways it's a, it's a bad thing. It's like a tragedy that he went out like this, but like I, I wrote about this, I think on Twitter, I definitely got the feeling this time versus after for brawl in versus brawl out, like brawl out. There was a lot more agita online. A lot of people like, Oh, this is horrible. We can't lose punk, you know, where this time I saw a lot of people on like every side, basically being like, I'm just glad this is over and this isn't constantly a topic and constantly hanging over everyone's head and being like this, you know, people call CM Punk the black cloud. Like it was kind of a black cloud over the whole promotion for good or bad. And so, yeah, in that sense, it's sad that it got to that point where 
it's like when you go from your you wanting your parents to stay together, you want them to start stop arguing and just get along to like you just want them to divorce because you're tired of the arguments. Like that would honestly be better at that. It, it had gotten to that point. Yeah, I mean, and it, it felt like it was this piece that was really like poisoning everything about AEW. Um, no matter, and especially because of the media environment we live in, like no matter what happened on the show the, the night before, or someone could have a really good match, or there could be something you're excited about, it always came back to punk. It always came back to whatever backstage news was happening. I mean, I had Warren Hayes on my show shortly after our first podcast, uh, as I was making the tour of just Canadian pundits appearing on my show, <laughs> um, and we just basically talked about like the whole economy of news that was just basically CM Punk news and updates. And we, you know, we talked about there being a, a, a podcast that would just update CM Punk news. I mean, that was like a lot of wrestling podcasts. Wrestling Observer Radio had a lot of CM Punk news pretty much every week, pretty much any weekly, you know, generic re recapping the news wrestling podcast was spending a lot of time talking about CM Punk because it just always seemed to be like something was popping up. And it came, I think, oftentimes at the um, detriment of what anything else that was happening in the company and really all of wrestling. There was nothing more magnified than the CM Punk story, even in WWE. I remember, I don't know if it was with you or Warren Hayes, but I mentioned like WWE just got sold or WWE is having a merger, like the biggest news about WWE possible. And we're still like that's like a one day story, and then we're back to whatever CM Punk did. It was madness. Yeah, because yeah, it, it there kept being twists to it. I mean, how many times during the story, like you could think about, it went from you know, you know, will CM Punk ever return to AEW? To okay, will he ever work with the with the elite? To you know, will he return to AEW again? to now it's will he go to wwe like like this like just the scope of the story in a year's time like the ultimate end possibility keeps shifting so i mean that's what kept it fresh in that sense if you could call this story fresh it seems kind of weird to trivialize it like that but i mean it kept the argument what we were even discussing kept changing yeah, and so when we um when we last talked, we kind of talked about it was clear that CM Punk was going to make a return to AEW, and the rumor at the time was that there was going to be this brand split between Dynamite and the upcoming Collision show debuting, and that Punk was going to have Collision, and that the Elite were going to have Dynamite, and there was going to be a soft brand split with certain wrestlers on each side. And you and I talked a lot about how that probably wasn't a good idea, and we both, I, or if I recall correctly, had kind of similar belief that CM Punk and the Elite really needed to work a program on television yeah. to kind of put this all behind them. They can't be siloed off in their own little universes because the fans are going to be uh, demanding that they address each other and that they make it work. And I, we were kind of, at least the logic I was using in a lot was that they have to figure out a way for to make this work because historically when people don't like each other in wrestling, but they realize that they can make money, they will work together. And I just kind of, I just kind of assumed that would eventually have to happen, um, but it never did. And we can get into why it never did. But talk to me, like, kind of how you felt when Collision first debuted, and it became kind of obvious that Punk wasn't really going to have anything to do with the Elite, at least at the at the moment, and was kind of going to start. You know, we had the match with Samoa Joe. He feuded a little bit with Jay White. Then he had the Ricky Starks program. How did you feel about in terms of like, this is CM Punk's return to pro wrestling and it kind of has nothing to do with the elite outside of some veiled shots he's taking in a promo? It's it, it's funny because on one hand, I really liked like the punk collision. You know, I, it did feel like a, a somewhat different show while still feeling like enough like AEW that it didn't feel like a completely different product, but it, it did feel like it had its own kind of pace and, and maybe a more limited scope and and i enjoyed that and i and i liked punk's work i don't know if he quite seemed quite as spry as he did the uh on his first AEW run but he was coming back from a long layoff um but there was something 
that felt off about all of it. And I think part of that was that I think something we probably discussed on the first time I was on, or at least if not, that's what I wrote about, which is everything Punk did felt a little duller than it should have by comparison because you had this big feud with the elite hang over there like like punk doing these very basic kind of didn't do there wasn't much meat to the samoa joe feud like they barely put that together the match in time for um all all in and it was like the most basic kind of angle set up you know the ricky starks thing had one or two good angles but again it didn't seem like like punk was not cutting many promos on these feuds to really build them up and it was just like it was hard to take it seriously that like oh he's really mad about ricky starks or he's mad about samoa joe when at the same time during this period he's cutting promos about people he really does have issues with that are crackling with all this energy. And then by, and I think the problem is by comparison, it makes all the traditional wrestling angles just feel for lack of a better word, faker. Like, and in a way he brought that on himself because yes, you know, that first collision promo where he taught, he brings up the counterfeit bucks line. That's a, that's a fun snarky line. It got a lot of attention, a lot of talk, but again, it was, it, it never paid off to anything, you know, the, the hangman, you know, peg warmer thing that grad was not on the air, but he had to know doing it right off. That was instantly going to make it its way online. People were going to film that on their phones. Um, again, it completely made everything else he was doing. It's, it, you know, it seemed like he was more invested in that than the feuds he was in. And it, the one, the, the one last thing I'll just end on this is it's funny like it's like a lesson he did not learn because i remember the uh years and years ago when he was doing like kind of hinting around with steve austin about a feud you know where they were doing that thing where they had a sit down interview together to promote a video game that one of the wwe games they were both in and they were having some fun kind of back and forth and people were getting excited and the word was vince mcmahon got really pissed off and like shut that down it's like stop doing this like playing footsie with each other because if Steve isn't going to do this, I don't ever want to, um, you know, tease a feud that I can't deliver on. And, you know, there's a lot of things in life and in wrestling I don't agree with Vince McMahon on, but I do agree with that. And every little mention Punk is doing with this during the collision days, every time he does the peg warmer, every time he did the, you know, the counterfeit bucks line, it's like he did not learn that lesson, which is you're you're stealing focus and you're just getting people's hopes up for something at that time you had to at least know you're not going to deliver on. Yeah, that's an interesting point you're raising. So you're kind of saying like by making these, you know, work shoot style pro, uh, little shots at the elite in Hangman Page, he's kind of undermining the the real feuds he was working on television because – Deep down, you know, fans really want to see Punk and the Elite feud. And if the, he knows that's not in the cards, but he's trying to, I guess, will it to happen by making these little comments. It's undermining, you know, his feud with Samoa Joe or his feud with Ricky Starks because they feel like they're coming off a second fiddle behind the real story, which is CM Punk and the Elite. Yeah, and, and to be fair, the first comment, the counterfeit butts, Bucks comment, like I can kind of let that go because in a way, I, I part of me does feel like, you know what, when you come back, it's every, what everyone's talking about. You kind of maybe need to, you could argue, maybe you need to make one comment just to acknowledge it, you know, let people know like, hey, it happened, a little wink, and then move on. But then, you know, again, something like the peg warmers hangman thing, like just it, it becomes a pattern, you know, it, it, it just becomes a pattern and a distraction. And it, it was the thing people were talking about far more than the two feuds he was actually building to matches on. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned with punk coming back, uh, I think in some ways the demand for, you know, punk and the elite to, to, to wrestle from the fans was not there the way I thought it was in terms of I thought CM Punk every match he he would wrestle anytime he came out in front of the live crowd people would chant the elite Adam or Colt Cabana or whatever and whenever the the Bucks came out people would be chanting for CM Punk and that really didn't happen it came to the degree that I've started to believe that in some ways like maybe they can just 
silo them off and this might be able to work because I thought the fans would totally kind of like take over any segment either performer was taking part in because they wanted to see this this match happen but they never really did that um so on one hand I was thought for a brief period of time very brief I thought this might be able to work now you touched on something with your comments in regards to different programs he was working in. I agree with you in the sense of I enjoyed Collision um, for what it was trying to accomplish in a lot of ways as a AEW program that felt different than Dynamite. Um, obviously, it was taken very seriously. Uh, unlike Rampage, there were major matches on Collision. There were major storyline developments. It was the exclusive home, essentially, to see some of the most prominent wrestlers in the company. With that being said, and even with Punk's performances, I can't necessarily say that, oh, he cut this terrible promo or, he oh, he had this terrible match because he really didn't. But I found C the, the creative end that CM Punk was participating in, I kind of thought it was a complete disaster. I thought if you just looked at what he did on Collision, the two months and, or one month and change that he was there, he debuts, he, he re-debuts. He has his match with Samoa Joe, which he wins. Uh, then he goes on like this short feud with Jay White. Then he, then without really resolving that feud with Jay White, kind of still in the background, he's feuding with Jay White. Uh, he starts feuding with Ricky Starks. So he's now he's kind of feuding with Ricky Starks. And then at, you know, the Wembley Stadium show at All In, who does he wrestle? Not Ricky Starks. He's wrestling Samoa Joe again. Why? Who knows? And if he was since he did wrestle Samoa Joe, why why did Samoa Joe lose the first match? Wouldn't it make more sense for Samoa Joe to have won that first match so Punk wants revenge? Um, so we kind of had this sloppy feud with like three different people. Um, and then on top of that, he's making comments about the elite. He's making comments about Hangman Page. He's running around with a his own version of the world title, calling the, you know himself the real world champion. So he's doing this like pseudo feud with MJF. And so he's feuding with like these seven or eight different people. None of them are as effective as they should be. Uh, with, in terms of the elite and MJF, it feels like he's shooting his own angle and the other parties want absolutely nothing to do with them. That seems very clear now. Um, and so I just, I was like, what, what the fuck is this guy doing? It made no sense. And it really uh, undermined what could have been a much stronger return for him uh, coming back to the collision if he was just feuding with one person or it was just done more linear. It seemed like his, the creative on his part, and it seemed like he had a lot of control over his creative, and he had a lot of control over the creative and collision in general. Um, it seemed like it was all over the place. And it was something that I think kind of flew under the radar because he was such a big star, and when he was doing stuff, people were always intrigued, and the shots of the elite got all the media attention. But just looking at like what he, the kind of different creative storylines he was involved in in collision they all vastly underachieved what they should have been able to achieve given his star power and the star power of people he was feuding with. And I think a lot of that has to do with the complete inconsistency in how he went out there and promoted these feuds. See, I think part of that, I, I wouldn't put specific to just the punk feuds. Like I, I agree with your points, but I would say like, I feel like the build to all in and all out this year there was a lot of sloppiness and like kind of what are they doing vibes and like things coming together at the last second for the punk stuff, but also for like a lot of feuds for those two pay-per-views, I feel like they really just lost the thread for that month for a, a lot of reasons. And so in a sense, he, but, but I will say punk added to it. Cause like you said, you know, I forgot even, you know, yeah, the, the real world's champion thing which is you know suggesting an mjf thing and maybe at one point he thought he was going to have a feud with mjf and then you know maybe mjf decided maybe he thought hey you know the adam call thing is picking up steam and you're so toxic that you know what i'm gonna now turn this into a from a maybe to a pass who knows but yeah so much about punk on, on collision it was like pulling in eight directions and pushing against the wind because you also heard you know he wants to be a heel but the company feels like he needs to be a face and you know sometimes you know you would see you, often after the shows but like when the crowd was jamming he'd kind of 
needle them back a bit or, you know, and clearly was gleefully enjoying that. And it was just like, he's trying to build, you could argue, four feuds at once. MJF, the Elite, Ricky Starks, um, and Samoa Joe. Only two of those feuds are feuds that people that they actually can deliver on. Those are the two feuds he's arguably building up the worst. He's kind of a face, kind of a heel. He's a face who wants to be a heel. Like... In a, in a way, I think that was reflected. Like it was funny. It was interesting to hear you talk about what you kind of expected the reactions to, be, because I wonder how much pushing in all those directions affected his reactions. Because I thought his reactions during this last run were interesting. Where a lot of times, not on every show, but a lot of shows, it felt like Punk would get an initial pop when he came out. It'd be like maybe a seventy thirty or eighty twenty cheers to booze, and then the more he was out there the more they would start to boo. It was, it'd be like, people would be like happy to see him because he's a big star. And then they would be like, they would start to remember everything that happened the last year. And then maybe some fans would boo and they'd realize, eh, it's more fun to boo him than to cheer him. And then slowly over the course of a bunch of his matches, like even the all-in match with Samoa Joe, it's like, as that match kept going on, even though the story of that match is like Soulsy Punk getting sympathy, getting the shit beat out of him, the more that match goes on, by the end, it goes from like a split crowd to they're mostly on Joe's side. And I feel like that kind of typifies Punk's whole last collision run, which was he was kind of pushing against things and getting these weird middle ground mixed reactions as a result. So you mentioned that the, really across the board in AEW, um, the creative building up both to all in and all out was a bit of a mess. It felt like there was inconsistencies between Dynamite and Collision. Um, probably neither pay-per-view kind of had, you know, the, a lot of the matches on both of those cards probably were under-promoted in terms of what they had done to build them up. Uh, do, you, do you think AEW's creative since um since all in or i'm sorry since all out has like but especially between dynamite and collision do you think that it has improved and that it's uh more linear i i've liked the the show since i haven't loved them but i would say in terms of focus it definitely feels like they've gotten some kind of message but maybe that's just because look if they're in another month where they have to build two major shows at the same time and they have to, and one of them is was two is two weeks after basically after all out or whatever two three weeks and then the other's not going to be more, much beyond that but it did feel like right after all out this year from the very first dynamite both the both dynamite since then every single segment on the show has been focused on building a match either for you know grand slam or or wrestle dream and that's what they needed to do that's what they were missing last month you know that when you have this many shows coming up this quickly you can't waste time on just random matches you know I, i'm not i'm not against random matches but when you're building up multiple big shows in a very short time period you kind of have to get on your bicycle and start pedaling like very quickly and so there are still things i see about aw creative that i don't love that i've been creeping in but in terms of focus i think it's night and day and it's interesting because one thing tony khan's typically been good at is i think he's a pretty aware about criticism and you could tell he had heard that criticism criticism at the all-out press conference and that it had got to him but he was kind of defiant because he was talking he kept he referenced multiple times about like people criticize the build to these shows. He's like, I'm never going to listen to those people again because you know, look how these, how great these pay-per-views were and how successful they were. And it's like, well, people weren't ever doubting the quality of the matches that like, that would be, they were built like doubting, like criticizing the quality of the builds and maybe how sexy the lineups were on paper. But, you know, despite him being kind of defiant, I think, it's likely he did take that to heart because again, I think it's night and day how focused the shows have been since all out. It, it's like this time he's definitely just been more laser focused. Do you think it's a coincidence that the show seem more focused since CM Punk was fired? Um, I honestly would think it would be more likely that maybe he's just taken the criticism to heart and he's, doing a reset but now you know often you see the reset after a pay-per-view it's a whole new pay-per-view cycle I, it probably is 
I mean, it's probably also easier where now it's you don't have to cordon, you know, cordon off one group of people. You know, you, you there are probably there's probably still backstage drama. There's probably still last minute changes that have to be made. But you don't have things like, oh, we told Jack Perry he could shoot an angle. And then when he gets to the building, the guy we've gotten given all this power tells him he can't shoot that angle. And now we have to figure out what to do. So, I mean, imagine that stuff. Yeah, that will help with focus. Yeah, I mean, it could be a coincidence and obviously like moving past the two pay-per-view cycle, the back-to-back pay-per-view, you know, all in and all out kind of uh, naturally kind of hits a reset button in a lot of ways and allows them to kind of get back on track anyway. Um, so it could be a coincidence, but it has not. I, I'm aware of the idea that CM Punk apparently, you know, wielded a lot of control for what Collision was and kind of had the ability to tell to decide who was going to be on the show and who wasn't going to be on the show and who was going to be allowed to be in the building and who wasn't going to be allowed to be in the building. And with him gone, it does feel like Dynamite and Collision are interacting more. It seems like they're able to build angles that took place off Collision and, and put them on Dynamite and vice versa. Uh, it just seems like it's, it's probably easier to book without that you know loud voice in the room that was CM Punk. And like you said, not having to kind of book around you know whatever mood he's in when he when he was there uh it, i think that the improvements we've seen over the last few weeks in terms of focus um could very likely be tied to punk no longer being in the company it, it, it's it's interesting that you bring up you know him having that power because i honestly think that was one of the big mistakes they uh they may with it might have been an unavoidable mistake on this comeback because I mean because maybe he would have just insisted on having some kind of power and he wouldn't like to not have a voice especially if he's being cordoned like put away into this other brand, but I wonder how much like on just on paper that seems like a really bad idea right like you take this guy that's very divisive in the locker room some people love him some people can't stand him. And who's already the reason why one of the reasons why he pissed off some people is they see whether it's true or not that he used his power to like kind of deny people opportunities or bully, you know, a cult cabana off of something, you know, what again, whether that's true or not. And now you're putting him in a position of power where he is outright directly to people's faces, telling them, no, you can't do that. No, I don't want you here. Like I would have done anything I could, but if I was Tony kind of tell punk, like, even if you want this power, we can't let you directly be the guy that tells anyone any like I know you like wasn't there that thing a long time ago? I think Robert brought it up on Twitter. Like there's a thing where like Cody Rhodes was talking to someone on some interview in WWE and they're talking about how back in the old days to remember there was a guy who was like always talking about how they were a locker room leader and they were saying, you know, if a person has to say they're a locker room leader, they're not a locker room leader. And and then one of them said, you know, that was Punk, right? And the other guy was like, I wasn't going to mention his name. But I think Punk's a guy who likes to see himself as a rocker. He did that even back in the ROH days. And I know there were people that didn't like it back then. Like, I think he likes to see himself as a guy who's giving back, who's policing things. And I think some people will appreciate that from some of him, some don't. But I feel like it was the worst time and place to put him in that position here. Because, again, like, think about the, the Jungle Boy thing. If, if 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 it's not punk telling him no if you if they could have convinced if even punk gave word to someone else and they told jungle boy and they could have done it in a way that made jungle boy think that cm punk had nothing to do with it none of this last thing happens you know there's no resentment there's nothing like the fact that you're putting cm punk in the position to be the bad guy the position you know the giving him this power to again after people got mad at him for like oh you block Colt Cabana for having a work opportunity now you're literally having Punk in a way that he's not even denying telling people you can't come to the show you know oh you were flown down here I, I, I'm gonna tell you at the door where you can't even come into the building like that is there there are things I, we could talk into later that I actually think people have been too hard about Tony Khan in this dealing with this that's one thing where I look at and go. How could you have not seen, like, on the very surface that this was going to go badly, putting this guy in a position where he was going to have to tell people no, deny people things, and not think this was not going to create more resentment, more gossip, more situations like we got? Well, to me, um, 
the whole collision thing, and, and I wrote an article back. This was published on August 15th, and it's titled, Tony Khan has failed to solve the CM Punk problem, and time is running out. And it's on VoicesOfWrestling.com if people want to read it, or if you haven't read it yet. And basically, I was looking at, this is right, I wrote this kind of right after the news about how, you know, Hangman Page wasn't allowed in the building when he was supposed to, to film a, a pre-tape. Uh, at a, at a collision taping and that you know supposedly Christopher Daniels wasn't allowed to come to dyna, uh, collision and that Ryan Nemeth wasn't allowed to come to collision and he had confronted Ryan Nemeth you know when he was backstage at Dynamite and the crux of of what I was writing was essentially Tony Punk Khan has empowered this person in CM Punk who is their biggest star and like Tony Khan's favorite wrestler to have all of this authority and as big of a star as he may be, his authority is undermining your promotion. It is drastically changing the positive vibes and energy that had been associated with this company when it first launched. And he's not the only person that's responsible for that, but he absolutely is the biggest person responsible for that. And turning AEW from like this fun promotion that people enjoyed kind of seeing all of these indie wrestlers and wrestlers WWE didn't want come together and, and try to make a, a historic run at something in this business and turning into this drama filled constant locker room soap opera that had become. And Tony Khan had empowered him with all of this stuff, like you said, and the ability to go backstage and to tell jungle boy, yo, you can't do this. Uh, you can't use real glass. If you want to do that, go on Wednesday. This is my show. Um, and he had done all of this stuff and had empowered CM Punk to do all this stuff. And it, it occurred to me, at least, like my, my thoughts were a few weeks before he was fired, really after the, um, the, the hang, you know, he was keeping Hangman from the building. My thought was just simply, he can't do it. Like CM Punk can't do it. He can't be a wrestler in AEW. He just mentally, he couldn't, he can't do it. He had a chance to come back after a brawl out. He had a chance to come back and kind of show everyone that he could be a team player, that he could be a, a responsible big star. And he failed at pretty much any point, at every point. Uh, the first time he showed up at a Dynamite, uh, he apparently confronted Ryan Nemeth about Ryan Nemeth, you know, tweeting something out about a, a promo that that Punk had cu cut on Collision. He uh, was constantly, uh, you know, trying to work the media and manipulate a narrative that was favor to, favorable to him. He buried Hangman Page in a uh, ESPN.com article right before he came back. He... um was just constantly a negative presence in AEW. Uh, and it just became really obvious to me. It's like, he's he had to go. And this was before the all-in fights and, and you know, the, the the backstage, you know, production cameras spilling everywhere and Tony Khan fearing for his life that we heard about later. But after I kind of heard, it's like, okay, he's banning Hangman Page from the building. And then the whole Jack Perry story that came out the day after, which was really obvious to me. Uh, why that came out a day after the Hangman Page story came out. Um, and it was just like, this guy can't do it. He can't be in the ba backstage anymore. He can't be a wrestler in AEW. He's not professional enough. He's mentally unable to accomplish this role. And it's sad because he's a big star and he would be capable of great work if he was capable of doing this, but he's not. And AEW had to come to a conclusion that something had to be done about it. And eventually, you know, basically his hand was forced, but Tony came to the right decision, which was we have to terminate CM Punk, which is what he did. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to go back, like, you know, a, a big star in wrestling, having political power and influence over all sorts of decisions, that's not abnormal. That happens in every major promotion or even a lot of small rinky-dink promotions. It's happened throughout history. You know, Hulk Hogan got George Scott fired as Booker, blah, blah, blah. Steve Trevor, Austin. In, in any entertainment industry. Exactly, yeah. Steve Austin, you know, definitely did. But I think the difference is it, it, it's not – 
you don't see so much of that of that writing on the wall. It doesn't come out as as, as much gossip. Some of it filters up, but not quite as much and not so quickly. But also, I think the big thing was just so often there's a way to do it where it doesn't come from that person directly. And I think the big thing Punk needed, and maybe he wouldn't have allowed this to be hap happen, who knows, but he needed to be, if he wanted to wield some power, fine, but he needed to be insulated as much as po as possible. He, he needed to not be allowed to get his hands dirty at all. Like, and, there, and if you want to talk about like AEW being a sloppy shop, like that's where the sloppiness is. Like, for example, he should have never been if he didn't want Ryan Nemeth or someone there fine he should not have been the person to tell that guy and not not shouldn't have been having a confrontation but he wanted like, to be that person Trevor it, exactly he that's sought the problem. that conflict out well if that's the case obviously they should have either told him to really try to sit him down and explain this is going to hurt you like it's going to feel good in the moment you know being a dick to people you feel like was a were dicks to you always feels good in the moment, but long term it's not going to help you achieve your goals. But even just stuff like AEW was not on the same page with this guy in the sense of there was multiple reports of different pieces of talent that were booked for Collision or the Ring of Honor tapings before Collision would get to the building, you know, flew out there. We're at the we would get to the building and to, we're told not only are you not being used you're not even going to be allowed inside the building. You know, things like that where it, it – like, it just – it would have been so easy just to get on the page of, like, Punk, if you want people banned, give us a list. They'll never be booked here in the first place. We'll come up with excuses why they can't be here. We'll find other things for them to do. Like, you're not – if you are going to allow this guy, if he's insisting on some kind of political power, you're not doing anything to help him – even have a chance of this working by basically creating these situations where they constantly explode in a very direct public way every time where these people are finding out things from punk this the second before they're supposed to be at the show before they're supposed to do something like they could have handled that so much better you know again they should have insulated him as best they could basically said you want certain things to happen you tell us we'll make them happen but in terms of everything else you you act as if you're talent and nothing else. And if you want to have wield influence, we'll work it behind the scenes. You know, do you think a lot of these other big stars like Hulk Hogan, guys like that in the past, like were directly telling people, brother, you're not gonna have a job? You know, I'm sure there are certain examples, but I think more often he probably told Vince, you know, this isn't gonna work for me, brother. You know, I don't like this guy. And then Vince is the bad guy. That's the way it's supposed to work if you're going to be like this. But well, what, yeah, what you're just suggesting, Trevor, look, like, look, Jim Ross is right there, right? Jim Ross is famous for being, you know, Vince's dummy in terms of Jim Ross, you know, telling people that, you know, firing people and things like that. And the famous story is, you know, Vince loved me, but Jim Ross hated me or John Lauren yeah. Hades hated me or one of those people. So you're talking, you think he needed a, uh, a hatchet man to do his dirty work. Yeah, they, they needed someone. I mean, I think Tony Khan and CM Punk, they both needed somebody that was willing to be the bad guy. And like you just pointed out, historically in wrestling, you can pay somebody to literally have a job that even though it has a different title and some other responsibilities is really just be the bad guy. You know, be the guy that's the focus of all the talents, anger, the guy who has to deliver all the bad news. He gets paid well to do it. And they did not do that. They let... They let Punk be the – and again, maybe – like you were saying, maybe Punk really relished that. And I and I think that's a big story of Punk, which is he – I mean, I, you talk about articles. I wrote an article also for Voices of Wrestling. We're, we're in promotion mode. But um, where I – you know, it was basically the point was no one in this thing is eating a plate of shit. Like sometimes in life you have to – eat the plate of shit you have to do something you really don't like you have to you know grit and bear it something where you think you're in the right you just have to accept it in the in the knowledge that if you do this you're going to get more of what you want down the road and no one in this situation but especially not punk seemed really willing to do that and i, I think one of the most fascinating revelations in recent weeks was dave melter a week or two ago saying that um the young bucks apparently had a legitimate internal like countdown where they were telling people if CM Punk doesn't like blow up for six straight months, we will consider working with him. And that, that countdown clock continuously reset over the punk's term because, and it was funny because Dave Meltzer would say things vaguely in the weeks before 
all this blew up where like every time time punk does something like the counterfeit bucks you know the, uh, the clock just resets and i thought oh I think I and a lot of other people thought, oh, he's just talking like vaguely. But it turns out it sounds like, no, he was talking about like a literal clock that like that. That again, he was not telling anybody about till after this. And we the, the, fact, like, the factory has punk- gone X amount of days since the last accident. Exactly. And the and the funny thing is, one thing that was interesting from like Joe Lanz and stuff doing reports about, you know, what the punk side thought was one thing that he would always put out there. And I believe that the punk side was putting this out there was punk really wants to work with these guys. And sometimes when he's saying this shit, you know, hey, he he's just hoping to build up heat and everything you would hear from the elite side would be like the Dave Meltzer kind of stuff, which is every time he says this. It just makes it less likely this will happen. The clock gets reset, blah, blah, blah. And it makes me wonder, like, Punk, I think, is a very smart guy in a lot of ways. And I think he's very savvy and can see the scene in a lot of ways. And it makes you – I always go back, and I probably brought this up on the last time we did a show together, which is did he really believe that that was – like, how could he not see that this was only hurting? Like, did – like, could he just not help himself? Was he this insane that he really somehow thought this was making these little comments and jabs and little microaggressions was going to get him closer when all evidence seemed to be it was pushing it farther away? Like, because I guess the story at the end of the day is the story of CM Punk is a guy who, as much as he wanted maybe a feud with the elite, as much as he wanted to be back on Wednesdays, as much as he wanted to put this behind him, he liked being CM Punk and not you know he he's a guy incapable of eating the play of shit he's a guy incapable of letting any slight slide and say you know what i'm just gonna take this one on the chin and shut up about it and like in punk's mind right everything he did i am sure he was justified like he's thinking okay yeah i blocked guys from coming who didn't didn't like me from working collision you know what they're basically banning me from dynamite so he's gonna say they started it stuff like you know making little comments about them he i'm sure he's gonna say you know hangman page made the first work shoot comment so you know what i'm just following through blah 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 but at, at some point if you really want things you might not have been the guy in your mind that started things but you're also not the guy who's finishing it you you could have been the guy that finished it that just shut up you know let some people you don't like work there even though you're not allowed to work on dynamite be the bigger person that will reflect well on you and maybe you know maybe the bucks didn't really mean that six month thing you know maybe that's posturing i have a lot of different theories that you know that could have been them legit saying that that also six months funnily enough also syncs up really well with when their existing contract before they renewed would have expired so maybe that was a nice little chip to give to Tony during negotiations like you know if he stays for six months, you know, right when we would start a new contract, you know, maybe we'd work with him. Maybe this just is a way to make themselves look good. But it also could have very well been an honest, genuine, sincere thing from the Bucks. And again, if that's the case, Punk could have had a lot of what he wanted if he just didn't tell Ryan Nemeth not to show up. If he didn't get mad at Jack Perry for making a dumb comment about Glass. If he didn't block Christopher Daniels from showing up at a... I mean, it's just... I don't know. There's so many angles from that. It's so confusing to know what's going on in his mind about this stuff. Yeah, I don't want to diagnose him too much. I think there's yeah. like a level of paranoia and ego that was driving this. Um, and I think, I mean, people get a people get like offended, like you say someone's stupid because saying someone's smart, saying someone is really smart and someone is really stupid is is not really an accurate portrayal of real life. People, we all know people. Everyone is smart in their own way and dumb in their own way. Uh, for the most part and i thought i thought punk handled this like really dumbly like i thought his instincts were bad i thought he didn't read the room at all if this was his plan it was a terrible plan i thought he really sloppily tried to work the media uh, into feeding different narratives and things like that Uh, i thought it was just i i was amused by some of the attempts at it because it was so obvious like for instance let's let's go back in time here uh The um, story comes out, I believe it came out on a Sunday, that CM Punk uh, had had stopped Hangman Page from uh, attending an episode of Dynamite, or a collision. And he he was supposed to, you know, Page drove down from his home in Virginia to a show in North Carolina. 
and was supposed to do a pre-tape and he got to the building and they said ah maybe you can tape this outside the building and now apparently punk didn't claim that he wasn't responsible for that but and, and that goes to your point trevor about like getting a hatchet man to come in and do punk's dirty work even though uh punk explicitly wasn't like slam and locking the door and, and telling page to scram people figured that page wasn't allowed in the building because of punk yeah and, and, and there's a vacuum right like if someone doesn't directly take the fall from it they're going to assume the yeah. obvious thing well someone could have been like oh yeah we're, we're taking you out but and, and that whole thing set my alarm bell ringing because it's one thing for like Ryan Nemeth to be banned for collision because, you know, he's a prelim guy and big stars are allowed to bully up prelim guys. But with Paige is a maybe not as big of a star as CM Punk, but a huge star in his own right and had just signed a, a surely multi-million dollar contract extension with AEW. So we're talking about a major, major star that you just invested a lot of money in. And even he is being prevented from entering this building because of CM Punk. That's a whole different uh, kind of can of worms but that story hits right um and you know there's a a day or two goes by where there's all this negative pr for punk punk's a monster punk's banning christopher daniels punk's you know banning hangman page from the building what a, what a what a terrible person all that stuff is hitting the airwaves and then all of a sudden for whatever reason suspiciously a story breaks that tells about this time CM Punk showed some serious veteran leadership where he had to, had to come in and tell jack perry to not use uh real glass and it wasn't safe and the story comes out that presents punk as being like this very enlightened veteran leader of a locker room and apparently this incident with perry happened weeks and weeks before it wasn't something that just had happened so this story gets manufactured out of kind of thin air right after punk just had a terrible pr week uh in relation to the hangman page story and to me uh you know with my owning my my instincts which are, are perfectly owned through years and years of political reporting could, could sniff this out in terms of, okay, well, Punk leaked this out, or someone opposed to Punk leaked this out to the media to kind of counteract the negative press that Punk had gotten, which ironically ended up totally biting Punk in the ass because it lit a fire under Jack Perry, who was probably mad that he was just dragged into this, you know, he was made to seem like a, a petulant child in order to stroke Punk's ego and to get some Punk some positive PR. And that is surely what led to Jack Perry saying the real glass line uh, on the all-in pre-show, which of course led to the backstage fight. Um, and all this went because Punk really sloppily tried to manufacture uh, and control the story about what was getting out there and how people viewed him. But the train was already uh, had already left the station at that point. There was no, I think, rehabilitating his re reputation amongst people. Uh, and so with all of that being said, uh, I think to, to your point, Trevor, about how Punk could have gotten all he wanted if he had just kind of laid low for a while or, or, you know, lasted six months or anything. But he didn't really want that. He wanted to feel like he had won, which was, I guess, in her, his terms, trying to make it seem like, you know, if he took enough shots at the Young Bucks or he took enough shots at MJF or whoever he was enemies with. They would eventually come to come around and play ball because that's how maybe the business that CM Punk grew up in, in the background that he recognizes, that was how you did things. And the Young Bucks come from, despite there not being a huge difference in age, Young Bucks come from a different environment. Um, and the business is different. Like we talked, I mentioned this earlier, we just assumed they would work together because if they were able to work together, that would mean money. But all these guys were making millions anyway, whether they work together or not. Yeah, they're not getting points on the – I mean, I don't think they're getting any points on, like, the gate or the pay-per-views or anything like that. So Sure. Yeah, and they're not getting – If the Bucks just re-signed, they're not going to make any more if they – I mean, they would be, it would be good for them as employees. Yeah, to... they're not getting a piece, you know, a piece of the house tickets or whatever, uh, a percentage of house tickets sold and things yeah. like that. It, it, and and that's, a, that's kind of a major difference in terms of, you know, if we go talk about fee, people not liking each other in the 80s or whatever – well, guys would work together because they knew their money. Hogan and, and, and Savage, even though they didn't like each other, would work together because they knew they could draw money when they were feuding with each other, even if they didn't like each other. And the business is radically different. Um, you make money by you, – you want to know how you make money in wrestling, Trevor? Now. Wow. You just shut up and you just go to work as a professional and you hope management likes you enough to kick you around. You know, Dolph Ziggler has probably made – 
more money in wrestling than like all but a very small handful of wrestlers, including many wrestlers that were much bigger stars than him. And he did that largely by just being a guy backstage and being reliable. That's really how you make money in wrestling these days. Yeah, th- that's the dream WWE job is like to be the mid card guy. I mean, that's not the dream job, but like to be that guy that's just high enough that you never fall into like the bottom rung when it's time for cuts, but you're just high enough that they kind of they kind of forget you exist, and you you just wake up one day and you're like a 15 year lifer veteran there. Yeah, knock on wood, because cuts are supposedly coming tomorrow. Yeah. Although it sounds like that's going to be probably behind the scenes a lot of the 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 lovely word redundancies, you know. Yeah. Love Nick, that Nick word, Houseman, but, um, I saw said that talent cuts are expected, so we'll see we'll see what happens. I'm sure by the time most people listen to this, they'll uh, Dolph Ziggler could be no longer with the company, but the point still stands mm. that like your Dolph Ziggler's, the Miz, our Truth, who will have a job of life because he can make Vince laugh, which is a, a critical role. But just in terms <laughs> of just, I was I was talking about this with someone else in terms of Roosh. Uh, you know, Roosh coming from Mexico and coming from an environment where uh, you drew money by really protecting your, your your reputation fiercely and playing promoters against each other. And that's how you made money in Mexico. And I think him coming to AEW and he's been, by all accounts, a, a model employee in AEW, uh, surprisingly so. And he got a new contract from AEW. And part of that is maybe him doing the calculus, realizing that he can make a lot more money uh, just being a guy in AEW and being, you know, an upper bid card guy, moderately protected, but just a solid worker than he probably would doing anything in Mexico. That's just a reality, the economics of the business and the kind of financial power that these two companies, AEW and WWE both have. And the business is different. And I don't know if CM Punk calculate figured that into his calculated thing especially because uh the you know tony khan was will, wasn't going to force the young bucks to, to work with him and he wasn't going to force mjf to work just like tony khan wasn't going to force cm punk to work with people that he didn't want to work with yeah um so unless i just i just think he he almost went about this in like an outdated way I mean, like you were saying, I agree. I don't want to psychoanalyze punk, but my my impression is, you know, he probably wanted everything we're talking about that he that we're saying. Well, he seemed so like, why did he, you know, do this? That seems to hurt the things he's professing to want. But I think, you know, like a lot of people with a temper, you lose sight of things when that temper gets triggered, and. I imagine Punk wants all the things we talked about, but he didn't want them as much as he just wanted to always get the last word in and not let any perceived slight go unanswered. And yeah, if if you're that kind of person, you always get the last word in, but you fuck yourself out of a lot of things you want in the long term. I mean, you know. He lost millions doing this. We'll see. Like maybe he signs a huge deal with WWE and makes it all back, but he lost millions doing this. I was going to say, even though this is your show, this is one question I'm interested in, in asking you because I'm interested in talking about this. Go ahead. You know, there's all these all these theories going around, you know, in in the rafter punk left, where I know from reading some of your articles recently about wrestling journalism, a thing you clearly love, Jesse, which is the the the, the old um, anonymous sources say. But there was lots of, um, you know, some people in AEW think that punk wanted out, and some of them think he wanted out once he saw the collision rings weren't going to be that good. And some people think Punk wanted out when um, just right around now, because he saw that they were going to start getting clobbered on the, um, when they started to face football. And so the old Hulk Hogan, I'm going to go on vacation for a month when I know something's going to happen. That's going to destroy the ratings no matter what. And then some people think he wanted out when the elite, um, Resign, and that's something else that Dave Meltzer was kind of hinting at that there was this belief that maybe Punk was kind of hoping, and maybe hey, maybe that's a reason he was doing these little jabs that he was trying to make it uncomfortable for the elite, because the elite with the thought that if I can kind of push them out, this is my castle again. I don't. I mean, that's what Dave theorized right as soon as he started making comments about the elite, even when he was still injured, with the idea being that he's he's saying that he wants to work with them but he really means that he doesn't want to work with them and he's trying to kind of muscle them out of AEW. Yeah, and so there's all these theories that Punk didn't want, want it out and want all these things and that's why he did what he did the Jack Perry stuff. Now, 
I, I'm the kind of person, I'm an Occam's razor kind of guy. I believe the simplest explanation usually is the right, the, the most correct, the most likely to be correct. So my, my theory on that is Occam's razor in this situation would be CM Punk is a hothead. He always likes, to get, he doesn't like just taking something on the chin. He saw a guy make in front of the entire world a comment referencing him that was, you know, very much in his face. And so as soon as the guy comes back in the curtain, he gets into a fight with him. He's because he's an angry hothead, and now he's angry about the fight. So he instantly turns around and gets angry at his boss and blows up and wrecks everything for himself. Now other people are going to go are go, saying, "Oh, maybe he meant to do this." You know, he was trying to get himself fired. I, I'm not saying that's impossible. I have a hard time believing that as angry as he, he got, that he would that he would have a plan to be like, "I want to lose millions of dollars." Because I don't want to be seen as not drawing good ratings or because this, the the bucks are still going to be on dynamite. Like, I don't believe those things. I think it was it's as simple as he got mad. He lost control. He cost himself a big money job. But do you have any thought that like I, I was just wondering your thoughts? Like, do you have any beliefs in all these people? Because apparently there are a bunch of people in AEW, according to the rumors, that believe one of those four theories I just thought offered that Punk wanted out and that this, you know, he was pushing to get out through stuff like this. I mean, I agree with you. I think that, you know, he's a very instinctual person. And he made a rash decision, just like he made a rash decision to you know, blow up during the press conference and start fighting the young bucks when they when they come came into his locker room. Uh, I, I I can't. I definitely don't think like some of them maybe hold like a little more merit than it than than others. Like I don't think that he was like, oh, I'm worried collision ratings are going to be bad, so people are going to say I'm not a draw. Like, and we're going to come up against college football, and everyone knows the ratings going to go down. It's going to make me look bad online or whatever. Um, I don't think he's insecure in that way. I think he would like almost relish the challenge of being like, I'm the big star. I'm going to carry this promotion uh, again, no matter what competition we have. That's how I feel like his mentality is personally. Um, so I don't really buy that. I could see like the Young Bucks resigning. And if he was, he's, he's upset about kind of Tony, you know, empowering them more and more would be frustrating. And that frustration kind of boils over and leads to this physical confrontation with Jack Perry that he didn't need to have. But I, I I just simply think that this is how he is conducting himself now. And we have many, many different examples of that. And this was kind of the last straw. It wouldn't surprise me if he had some sort of thing in his contract that was like a no physical violence con uh, conduct, you know, when he was brought back after after um, the fight with the Young Bucks. Um, I mean, that's the rumor, right? That like he has some clause in his contract. I, I, where yeah, he... and I don't know. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. But it wouldn't surprise me if there was something like that because yeah. um, he was terminated with cause. Um, so that would that would make me indicate indicate that. But I, I, don't, I, I don't I find it hard to believe that he wanted out of AEW ultimately because I think he really enjoyed like the performance aspect of AEW. He enjoyed being in front of crowds again. He enjoyed wrestling again. He went out and he had a really good match with Samoa Joe uh, after he got in the fight with Jeff Perry. Um, so, and I, I think, you know, he liked ruling collision as his own fiefdom and, 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 you know, having his guys that he liked and, and having creative control over that end and all that stuff. I think he enjoyed a lot of that stuff. Um, I don't think he was just like looking for a way to throw that all away, not to mention all the money he lost by getting fired. I guess maybe he thinks he can go back to WWE. There was the idea that he was pitching himself to go back to, to WWE, um, you know, when he was recovering from his injury, uh, and he was technically still under contract with AEW earlier this year or late last year, but, you know, in that way he'll be able to make more money, but. I, to me, I, I think this was just a pure kind of instinctual reaction for him. And that's kind of how he's conducted himself for most of his wrestling career. Yeah, although by other accounts, there was also the fact that he had to be talked into having that really good match at all in because he threatened to quit. You know, the, he was reportedly telling people like, I hate it here. Um, right. I'm, sure I'm, I'm, so I'm just saying in general, like, like he, he, I got the sense when he was when the camera was on him. He still had this passion for pro wrestling and this passion for performing. He still mm -hmm. he was still having fun in, in that regard. 
yeah, but it, it, it was interesting to it would be interesting to know how much was his enjoyment in the ring versus how much of that was being outweighed or balanced by apparently him getting more and more angry at everything outside it. Because like going back to what you said before, like you brought up a great example of how Punk's side was so nakedly leaking things in response to things. I, I like the other one. There are other great ones. Was of course like right after All In, we just magically all of a sudden hear about punk's travel issues and then all of a sudden for like half a day the argument is like well were other people getting tra you know um travel options well it turns out nobody was and oh it turns out so so punk side says he couldn't get co in contact with anyone and then the, the other side says oh actually he did get in contact with someone we offered him a different uh, travel options and he chose to go on this and all this back to it the world's dumbest discourse by the way which which exactly. has trailed this story uh you know, since since the original, you know, fight at, at, in the press conference at at, at all out last year, um, and, and and the same thing with the uh, um, the, the the meeting with you know Punk. All of a sudden, you know, ma it's somehow magically when when Punk is um fired the next day or whenever we hear oh Punk was going to have a meeting with the Young Bucks and they canceled it at the last minute or whatever, and then you hear that back and forth like, no, we didn't. We, you know, we didn't ever agree to a meeting. Blah blah. So yeah, like every time a big story came out against Punk, the very next day you would get something else usually. And, and like you touched on, that's something that really hurt him too because it's funny where Tony Khan always has at different times referenced how he's so frustrated that the locker room won't keep quiet for the good of the locker room. Like he, I, I remember a year, a long time ago, he mentioned, apparently there was a report or I don't know if he said out in public or if it was just a report, but like, he was so proud of the locker room, keeping the Brody Lee health illness. That they kept it completely quiet. Like all those people kept it quiet. He was so proud of them. And he didn't know why they couldn't do that for other things. I would think, well, everyone liked Brody Lee. And that was a literal life and death situation. And all this other stuff is gossip among people that dislike each other. So it's not life and death, but I think this this story did show you people were keeping some things quiet to a degree because th that Jack Perry gets rejected on a storyline thing was apparently old news by the time it came out. That was like a week's old story. And it was only after that story came out where, with the side of it also being that Punk thought maybe Jack Perry was trying to get a vacation, blah, 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 but get himself hurt, that right after that, I don't think it's a coincidence, that's all of a sudden you hear all these weeks of, of stories, again, weeks old stories of the Ryan Nem stuff, the Christopher Daniel stuff, oh, you know, Matt Hardy thinks maybe he wasn't allowed, blah, blah, blah. Like, it did, it did sound like there were people that were kind of sitting on stories for the good of the company. And then you, you see how this gossip creates this never ending cycle of, well, once one person says something to kind of bolster their side, the other side feels like, well, if I was sitting on something, I can't sit on anything anymore. I'm not gonna just let myself be punked out, no pun intended. I'm gonna put out my side. And it just snowballs because every side, now it's back and forth, back and forth. So again, if he shuts up about, if he doesn't feel the need to, if the Jack Perry story doesn't come out, maybe, the Ryan Nemeth and Christopher Daniel stuff doesn't come out. Maybe like all this stuff. It's just because no one can just bite their tongue, take one on the chin. You have to get them the last word. It's just, it's just such a crazy thing. Yeah. I mean, it's like wrestling is a, is a industry ripe with paranoia and ego. That's, that's how it operates. And, you know, you, AW as, as, as kind of like a, you want AEW to be different. You know, I want AEW to be better than like historical pro wrestling has been. And in some ways there are, in a lot of ways there are, but there's always going to be ego and people wanting to get over as stars and people using different tactics to do that. And one of those is to leak negative information about people you don't like to the media. And the media is very willing to run any anonymously quoted or sourced information um, because that's the way the wrestling media operates for some reason. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that's just, that's, that's the reality we live in. And it's not going to change. I would love it if it changed, but it's not going to change, uh, sadly. And um, I want to kind of like, so do you think he'll go to WWE? Oh, I mean, who knows? Because I, I, if he, if we see him again, um, I could see him coming back to AEW in like years from now, like 
that could be something that could happen because time heals all wounds and all that. But if we see him in wrestling, you know, in the next year or so, it's it's probably going to be in WWE. I don't know. I don't know, Jesse. I was going to say, I called you mad. I do, do, do podcasts with Matt Feuerstein too much, but we're not enough, some might say. But um, I was just going to say that, that MLW is a dark horse. So all that for a dumb joke. But, um, well, I mean, it certainly seems like Punk wants to go back right with um the fact that the, the story is that you know i mean he showed up at wwe all those months ago the story was that he was talking to them trying to float the idea that like i think i might be getting bought out by AEW, and if so can can i come here i'll be you know i might here's a plan i could do this at the rumble i could do this blah 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 and aw i mean wwe basically tell him thanks no thanks i i, I guess the interesting question would be like is who i don't think anyone other than maybe the people deep within WWE right now, the top brass know if they'll bring Punk in or not. But I think the the more interesting question would be, should they? Because on one hand, you could say WWE's numbers have maybe softened in the last two or three weeks a little bit with like that bad number against football and stuff. But overall, they're still the hottest they've been in a long time. Like in theory, they don't need CM Punk. So in and, and one sense, there's a great argument for why take him on? Why to accept any headaches, any risks of upsetting anything when we're already doing great? And then the other side is, look how well Cody Rhodes did for us. You know, this is something that could potentially take a hot company, make it even hotter, draw some more big houses. It'll be a thing that gives another bit of a black eye to AEW. You can, you know, especially if this goes well for us, we, it'll, it'll reinforce the idea that, oh, AEW is just this sloppy shop that can't run anything well. You know, look, he, we, we managed him fine this time, you know, even though it didn't work well for WWE the first time. Like, so I honestly, if I was WWE, I don't even know what I would do. You know, I don't know if I would go, oh, this guy's more trouble than he's worth, or if I would roll the dice. Because, like, in a way, it's just like it's the same conundrum for WWE as he was for AEW on this last little run, which is the best case scenario is really good. And the worst case scenario is what we got. So I I don't know what I would do. I think that um it's really interesting. In the sense of, if you're WWE right now, business is, is going really well, all things considered. And for the first time in a while, it does seem like the company is able to produce some of its own stars instead of constantly relying on big stars from the past coming back. Like, they don't, they don't need The Undertaker or Triple H or Goldberg to come back to work a match at WrestleMania to make WrestleMania feel big and important. They seem capable of being able to do that with their own roster for the first time in a pretty long time. So the necessity to bring back a wrestler like Punk is not as high. Uh, especially because that wrestler in CM Punk comes with a lot of baggage. People might not want to work with him. He might not get along with management. There's apparently plenty of wrestlers in uh, WWE that have already worked with Punk before and aren't interested in doing it again. And so all that is, is working against him. But at the same time, business isn't hot forever. There'll be a period of time. And you mentioned, you know, the really bad raw rating. Uh, this is coming from this most recent Monday. Stuff happens where you say, shoot, what can we do to juice stuff happening? What, what can we do to, to make our stockholders, you know, feel confident about uh, the company? What can we do to please the network? Uh, and CM Punk is it will we'll always be out there apparently willing to work so stuff will happen where you'll be looking at the phone and being like hmm, maybe we should call him uh so i i think it's probably you know likely based on that um but it would be a very different environment uh he wouldn't be empowered the way he would in in AEW. he's not going to have his own show where he's going to run and he certainly won't have the kind of creative control in terms of what his character is doing and who he's going to work with. Uh, and and I would be surprised if he worked a real schedule in WWE. It would almost make more sense to use him as a special attraction that works a couple of matches a year as opposed to someone that's on Raw every week, even if that's something that he's willing to do. 
Uh, I think that's the absolute best way to use him. I wonder if he would want that. I wonder if he, again, if he's this guy who sees himself as giving back and wanting to be a locker room leader. And I wonder if he would insist on being day to day. Cause like you just said, I honestly, it would be ironic because Punk's big thing when he was a regular in WWE in the final years. And I don't think it's complete without merit. I think there are parts of what he was kind of naive about, but there was that big thing back in the, day where he really resented the rock and brock lesnar guys who were like big stars that came in just for very rare shows usually won and usually went over the guys that then had to work a regular schedule and and draw on the house shows and on tv every week and you know he resented this idea of you know the the part timers who get to be seen as a level above the 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 meat and potatoes day to day stars that have to kind of carry the promotion when they're not around. But like you were just saying, I think that's the best use for Punk if you came back to the WWE would be I would want to isolate him as much as possible, give him his own locker room with A Steel and Lars Fredrickson and a and a great spread, you know, whatever catering he wants. I would want to put him in for like a month here, a month there, you know, only probably do very few matches on TV. And I would just say like, we're going to treat you like Brock Lesnar. Remember how you hated Brock Lesnar and the rock. We're going to give you that treatment. You're, you're going to, we'll give you the main event of one night of WrestleMania. Like we'll, and, and I think you get the most of them because I think he does work better at this point as a special attraction, because I think some of the allure wears off. If you see him every single week in random eight man tags. And I think that would probably be better just in terms of not having him, giving people giving people people in the locker room don't like him having them know you're not gonna see him all the time like he'll be in for june then you'll get two months off like can you put up for that i I think that would work way better like i wonder if he would accept that yeah i mean it's interesting and i think that for me at least it's, it's it's really hard to say i think within wwe uh, one of the alluring things about WWE for Punk would be he came back to AEW and there was, when he came back to wrestling and there was, you know, the first dance and, and his first pay-per-view match and there was overwhelming support for him and the novelty of seeing CM Punk back in wrestling led to, to AEW's highest business numbers in a lot of cases. They that excellent Rampage rating. The, the most uh, purchased pay-per-view they've ever had was his first match uh, back. So you had all that. And then over time, the novelty wore off. His drawing power lessened. Part of that was just because we had seen him wrestle before and it was never going to be able to kind of recapture um, that 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 momentum he had when he first came back. And also part of it was, you know, his interactions with the news stories and the drama around him to the degree when he was on collision, it was debatable about how much of a draw he even was. And he certainly turned off fans that who had enthusiastically supported him when he first came back and had turned a lot of fans into saying, I don't care what happens to this guy. I don't want to see him on my TV anymore. He's too annoying. Uh, but if he were to go back to WWE, he'd kind of be able to recapture that novelty because he'd be coming back to WWE. And there are plenty of fans that never saw him in AEW because they're WWE only fans. So this will be the first time they would have seen him in, in over a decade. And all of that stuff would kind of be back on the table for him. And he would kind of get a second crack at returning to pro wrestling after, you know, his first attempt in AEW ended up going off the rails. You know, what's fascinating about that too, which is, I mean, I'm sure the WWE fans would be so excited. They take them back with open arms. They cheer big for them. They, they love them and they would look past this. But I think it'd be, I think one thing that's really fascinating is how punk would frame it or if he would even care, because remember, not only did he leave WWE on bad terms, not only is the one of the guys he was on worse terms with still one of the creative heads of the company, but when he debuted in AEW, his whole framing of that promo, which was a great promo, you know, on the second, you know, when he came back to uh, AEW was him saying, you know, the day I signed with WWE is the day I left pro wrestling. And the day I'm coming here is the day I returned to pro wrestling. You know, like basically, he, you know, his whole thing was they took something I loved and made me hate it. Like, how do you sell? Like, I'm sure they would, but I wonder how punk in his mind could rationalize coming back as like, with that quote being so well known, like I'm coming back to the place. I hate, you know, I'm coming back to the place. I don't even consider pro wrestling. I, I mean, you know, 
<laughs> do you just lean into it and go, I'm a heel, I'm doing it out of spite, I'm doing it for money? Do you just go full disingenuous and be like, no, it turns out I love this place. Like, Yeah, he's a I'm liar. Sure he... wrestling, pro wrestling <laughs> li is full of lying. I know. It's just so funny, though, that, you know, he, he literally kind of pro. He's like, I left, you know, I'm back in W. Uh, you know, I'm back in pro wrestling. And to come back, like, it's just, you know, was he going to be introduced by Triple H at a WWE press conference? Like, here, Phil Brooks is back, folks. Like, it's just. But actually, I will say. I think the biggest risk if I was WWE about CM Punk would not be like him getting angry with someone backstage or something like that. I think the biggest risk is if things go well, because CM Punk has a, pa a pattern of doing something now that very few wrestlers, some do, but not that many, which is he's willing to just walk from very lucrative money, like, like on the eve of big matches, like he was willing to, when the WWE was trying to prompt him, like, Hey, it's, you know, you're going to get a big WrestleMania match with triple H, you know, it's not a match you really want, but it will be one of the bigger matches of WrestleMania with all the payoffs and, and, you know, spotlight that entails. And he walked because he was pissed off. He didn't want to be in the company at that time. And he was willing to leave everything behind. And he did same with, you know, AEW, he was, willing to walk at different points apparently when they were negotiating for him to come back to, to do collision there was two different times during negotiation where he threatened to leave and you know on the day of all in you know just he gets in the fight with jack perry and before he's about to open the biggest attended wrestling show in history and he was willing by all accounts to say i'm not gonna work today I quit. I don't, I want out. And Samoa Joe had to talk him into it. So the thing I'd be worried about if I'm WWE is like, I'm not going to be worried as much about him getting into a fight with Kevin Owens or, or Roman Reigns or whoever backstage. I'm worried about what if one day we book Roman Reigns versus CM Punk and we sell out like a 65,000 seat stadium for that match. And the week of the show, he has some ultimatum or he gets mad or he threatens to pull out or he does pull out like, what the fuck do we do now? Like, it's something WWE could survive. They could do a make good match. They, they they would be survive, obviously. But that would be the scenario I'm more scared of. It's like, what if we start to, what if this guy does, is a success again, and we do start to put some eggs in his basket, that's when he will get a little leverage. That's when he will become more of a headache again, because that's when he can say, because he's a guy who's willing to say no. He's a guy that, that there is some always will be some power in being the guy who's willing to just literally leave everything behind to not to touch on what you said earlier, to not be a Dolph Ziggler, to not just be happy to take the money. Like CM Punk is a guy for better and for worse that will say, fuck you. I'll, I'll burn it to the ground. I'll leave. Yeah. I mean, the, I, the thing with that is when he left WWE for the first time, the relationship between WWE's fan base and WWE management was really bad. Um, it was punk was a symbol for a lot of frustrated fans of WWE. And he, you know, when he left and especially like a year later, when he cut that, that, you know, he did the, the famous podcast with Cole Cabana, he, um, you know, he had a lot of support among the hardcore WWE fans, and that's why people chanted his name whenever they were frustrated with something happening in WWE. And if there was a boring match, they would chant for CM Punk and all this stuff. And anytime they came back to Chicago, you know, they would chant for CM Punk. And now, so when he walked out that first time, it was like this huge black eye for WWE. And of course, they survived and they did fine and they made billions of dollars. So I don't think they'd be that worried either way. But when he did walk out, it was this black eye for WWE because it was a sign of someone who a lot of the fan base sympathized with basically being pushed out because of what he perceived to be incompetence, which was then transferred. That feeling was then transferred onto the fans who felt like the company was incompetent. Uh, right now, the, the W fan base that they do have is way more uh, supportive of decisions WWE makes and enjoys, um, you know, pretty much anything the company produces as far as a live reaction. Uh, and if CM Punk were to walk out, they'd be WWE fans would probably just blame CM Punk, especially because this would be the third time he's walked out of a major promotion because he walked out of WWE the first time and then now he's walked out of AEW. I know he was fired from both of those times, but people won't, I, I think he's, he's burned the sympathy bridge. So there's less of a risk. If he, if he wants to walk away, then I don't think it's going to hurt you nearly as much as it did 
certainly the first time if you're WWE and probably not the the second if you're second time if you're AEW there's we we haven't seen a ton of we don't have a ton of data yet but it doesn't necessarily seem like CM Punk walking out of AEW is significantly hurt AEW yet yeah and you you just made a great point too which is a lot of CM Punk's identity has always been like he would say the voice of the voiceless you know being the guy who was Champing the change hardcore fans want. He was always kind of the, the symbol of that, and to the point where he would be the name they chanted for years after he left. Whenever there was a show they didn't like, a piece of booking they didn't like, and yeah, I, that's another fascinating thing. If he came back to WWE, is that audience is gone? Like like you were saying, AEW w- replaced CM Punk. Yeah, like I mean, in terms of like what was the symbol for WWE fan frustration, like fans don't hijack WWE shows anymore over a period of years WWE slowly and systematically ran off the kind of people that would hijack a show or chant CM Punk like almost ever the vast majority of WWE's audience now is true believers they're people that yeah like you were saying if, if CM Punk starts like they would they would take WWE side there would he I, I don't think you can do a CM Punk or Daniel Bryan style like insurrection among the fan base where enough of the fans kind of protest the company that you get this groundswell that kind of carries you through and convinces brass to change booking plans and things because yeah that wwe has finally created the audience they've always wanted which an audience which loves exactly what they're doing for the most part i mean i'm i'm sure i know i know there are some fans that don't like some aspect and they speak out about certain things but for the most part this is the most agreeable audience that promotion has ever had and well, it, it, certainly it, not the punk the audience punk grew up with in wwe right and you can look at like sasha banks right sasha banks essentially walks out of wwe last year very popular wrestler one of the biggest stars in the company how many times have you heard for sasha banks chance at wwe events yeah. since that happened um yeah so it's, that- it's more like a shrug of disappointment like oh, i'd like to have her back but and if anything, it turns a little against the talent. It's like, well, she, she's mm-hmm. too stuck up. She, I, I definitely saw tweets like, oh, she thinks she's too good for the prestigious WWE women's tag team titles. Like, you know, like they'll, yeah. And, and again, it, I wonder if Punk, that would be a culture shock for Punk where it's like, that's not the world he came up in in WWE. There would have been, out if Sasha Banks left during Punk's era, there would have been a, giant shit storm the likes which i would have been afraid for people's lives with the sasha stance they would have destroyed people but yeah not anymore yeah it's just different uh, the last thing i kind of wanted to touch on was just kind of more cm punk historically in terms of one of the fascinating aspects to me about this whole development is that wrestling history is littered with uh very talented successful wrestlers who were undermined by personal reasons and a lot of the time in fact most of the time when we talk about that we talk about uh like substance abuse issues and things like that that ultimately uh forced a wrestler to achieve less than they did uh and and punk is somebody who i think his career as successful as it has been uh he hasn't achieved as much as he potentially could because of personal issues but He's in the rare case where it's obviously not a substance abuse issue. It is, you know, uh, a paranoid issue and this seemingly pathological uh, need to to see enemies, to to spark conflict, to um, provoke other people. And just all of these things have unfortunately hurt his career and done things like what should have been a, a slam dunk wrestling observer newsletter hall of fame case and has, has put that in doubt too and he just seems like a really kind of unique case in wrestling history in terms of a major star that has been undermined not by by personal issues that um really he i guess people i don't say like people have less sympathy for that than like substance abuse issues but seems like something he would have be able to have more control over um, it's, it's tough. To, again, that would be like on analyst, psychoanalyst. Yeah. I don't uh, want even want to psychoanalyze. I'm just thinking he, he really stands out in terms of wrestling history and somebody who's didn't achieve as much as he should have. And it's entire, almost entirely because of like his own paranoia. Yeah. I, um, 
I've probably said this before because this is a thought I have, but I think Punk is fascinating in that sense, in that uh, he's, I don't know if I've ever seen another wrestler where I am simultaneously surprised he had the kind of the level of career he had and also feel like he left so much on the table because there's part of me that feels like I can't believe he even made it this far because I was always a big CM Punk fan from like the days of the indies, but I always thought even back then he had this brash speaks his mind you know, some people love him. Some people hate him at reputation. He, you know, was not a juiced up guy with big muscles. He was covered with tattoos. He had a snarky attitude. Like I thought this guy, he's going to be hard pressed to ever really make it in WWE. And then when he did make it, I was like, all right, he's going to be hard pressed to ever rise to the level of a top star. And then he rose to like a world champion level, but still not like top two in the company level. And then he got to there. And so like in that sense, I feel like, he did way more than I ever thought he would. But then on the other hand, this is a guy that left in his physical prime for years and years and years when he was about to be offered, you know, more major WrestleMania matches. You know, he left, he was the number, arguably the number two star in the biggest company in the world. He left in his prime. This is a guy that he came to AEW, the number two company in the world years later, had one of the great feel good comebacks of modern wrestling, had all these opportunities. And again, piss them away in a lot of ways, set them on fire. You know, we like we were talking about before, he could have potentially six months down the line even had that big feud with the elite. Who knows where that would have taken the company, would have taken him. But it, it, what I think it's one of those things where sometimes for some people, the thing that gets you where you're going is also the the fuel that that like the fire that fuels you is the fire that burns you. Where I don't know if CM Punk would have made it if he wasn't an asshole. And I also think, he's, or just that's a that's a very generalized word calling him an asshole because uh, you know, again he's a complicated person. But I think the things that people hate about CM Punk are also the things that people love about CM Punk. And I think it's the things. I don't know if you can separate the parts of him that got him all his success with the parts of him that cost him even more success. And yeah, like like I meant- yeah I I just we were I, I'll stand by saying we're. I, I don't know why we're picking on Dolph Ziggler, but you used him before. He's such a great example. He is the polar opposite of the guy who is just happy to get along. And that's why we love him. But that guy also costs himself some opportunities. You know, he's never been the guy that just bites his tongue and just lets things pass by for the larger win or for the safe bet. And he's living and dying by being that guy, by being the anti Dolph Ziggler. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned, I've mentioned a few times like paranoia and ego kind of being the driving forces, but those are the driving forces of a lot of very successful wrestlers and anyone in and very successful people in general, especially in the entertainment industry and especially in a competitive industry where being the best and being the top guy is something that you really have to, you know, strive for wholeheartedly if you're ever going to make it. Uh, you touched on something I think is really important that I hadn't thought about before. And we talk about kind of like the different environments CM Punk came up in versus the AEW environment. And you mentioned being a fan of him during his indie days. And if it, it, it's something that's lost now, but you really have to go back to like watching CM Punk in 2003 and seeing him. And at the time you would see him and you would say, I don't know if this guy can make it in WWE, even though he's really talented because the way he looks and the way he acts and how strict WWE's interpretation of who could be a top star was at that time. And that Punk really broke down a lot of those barriers. Uh, And by the time he came to AEW, like all of that is lost. Like no one looks at CM Punk in AEW and says, this guy's a top star because AEW was full of guys, top stars who looked and acted like CM Punk for lack of a better term. And WWE has become full of guys who looked and acted like CM Punk. And that is kind of lost now. And if you think about, okay, how did he, how, how did he become this trailblazer? How did he break down these walls? What was it about him that allowed him to kind of set the pace and influence all of these other people that were able to break through at the mainstream level in a way that no indie wrestler had been able to do before. And it's a lot of that kind of drive in, in that, in that, that, you know, that independent streak that he had and the uh, wanting to be the rebel and all of that stuff was really what took him that far. And I think that 
he should have at some point grown up and been professional when he should have been professional. But I do think that's something that's lost today, looking at like how much he had to overcome to get where he was and how that kind of probably fueled a lot of the paranoia. And to the degree, a lot of his behavior in AEW feels absurd because of what we have come to accept as as, as normal in that company. Um, but that was not the case when he was coming up as a wrestler. And he was a guy who hadn't been in a wrestling locker room in 10 years. And it goes back to what you were saying way earlier about how nowadays the way to have a great career in wrestling is just to not speak up. And there's good parts about that and bad parts about that. But something, again, that WWE's done so well, and it's kind of filtered throughout, I think, a lot of wrestling, is to beat down, you know, that's anything in wrestlers that says you should speak up, you should dream of being the main eventer, you know, you, you should always be striving for more, it, you know, with a lot of wrestlers now, they beat that out of them very early to you should just be happy to be here. Just being a quote unquote WWE superstar, as in having a spot on the roster at all is a giant win. Anything that you get above that is extra and you're selfish if you ask for more. And CM Punk was a guy who he never, I think one of the things that let him break through, if you're wondering that, about that, is he was a guy who never, ever let anyone br- beat an, a, a, a speck of his self-worth out of him. And he had a lot of self uh, of value, self-value where he thought, you know, I o- he always felt he deserved better and he usually did and he was never shy about letting anybody know whether it pissed people off or not and yeah he he now when he returned to wrestling i think he found a world where that is exceedingly rare you know it it still happens but it it sticks out a lot more now yeah i mean it's a really different environment in terms of you mentioned like the whole WWE mentality of you should be happy to be here. I, I just am really thrilled to be a WWE superstar and I get to wrestle on WrestleMania. Um, and that should be your dream and you should strive for nothing more. But the way that it, the way these people come up and the, the people that are getting into wrestling are, are different. And for starters, you're no longer like the environment of, I need to, the only way to make big money is to be a top guy. And to be a top guy, you also have to kind of be paranoid about people trying to take your spot, the company trying to replace you, not wanting to put guys over because, you know, kayfabe is still somewhat real in, in that I don't want to look weak on a, on, a, on a show and all of this kind of stuff. And people being very protective of their character and all this kind of like WCW level drama that doesn't really exist in pro wrestling because the industry is so different. And then the other part of it is, we have a generation of people that grew up watching shoot interviews and kind of nobody wants to be Shawn Michaels refusing to do jobs and being unprofessional and be the guy that people are all taking a, taking a, uh, a shit on in the shoot interviews later about how this person was unprofessional and this person refused to do jobs and all of that kind of stuff. Everyone kind of wants it's, if you're a hardcore wrestling fan and you get into pro wrestling and more and more of the wrestlers that are making it in the top scene are hardcore wrestling fans and grew up watching wrestling. It's almost like a badge of honor to be seen as professional, to be seen as someone that's willing to put people over someone that's willing to give you, give other people a lot of shine. Um, and historically that has been something that has been frowned upon by the top stars. And that's very different now. And I don't know. I think, I think punk, does understand that aspect of it but it just it, it changes the business to such a degree when you have those people who are now in top spots as opposed to your kind of typical paranoid i'm not going to do a job brother people yeah and also again just the ambition of like it, it, maybe he's thinking in a different world like wrestlers like the buck should be the thing that should overwhelm any personal animosity between mm-hmm. them is just the idea of you don't you want to be in the biggest possible angle but again wrestling has changed where when when cm punk was around he was a guy his goal was to be in the main event of wrestlemania a main event of wrestlemania i feel like a lot of wrestlers nowadays they're brought up where their goal is simply to be on wrestlemania any spot any match that's that's realizing the dream for for him he was of a, a guy and of a generation where no the goal wasn't to be a star it was to be the star you wanted the very top spot you want to be in the biggest angle that was worth anything you'd work with anybody you'd do anything and yeah i, I think wrestlers nowadays are like if i if i'm making a good living and i'm doing having a good enough career 
that's I'm not going to sacrifice like working with a guy I hate or I don't trust or all this stuff to potentially get a little more of that. Like wrestlers are more happy with what they have now. Yeah, and I think your goals and your your true aspirations evolve as you get further along in your career. I don't know if CM Punk first laced up the pair of boots uh, for the first time and said, my goal is to main event WrestleMania and I'll never be satisfied unless I do that. But as he got closer and once he got established in WWE and emerged as a top star, that obviously became the goal for him. Um, and like I remember in Chris Jarko's book saying like his first goal in wrestling was just to have a match. If he just had a match, he'd be happy. Once you have a match, you move on to your next goal, which is to have another match. And then it's to wrestle in this promotion. And then it's to make it to a big company. And then it it, it, it climbs and snowballs up and up as you get closer. And CM Punk got pretty much as close as anyone to having a main event at WrestleMania without actually having it. Um, and if he went back to WWE, he could, he could almost certainly have that. Yeah. Especially because WrestleMania will be like five nights in a few years. Exactly. Like that's the, that's the other ironic thing is he could probably have what he always wanted, but it means so much less now. How dare you say that, Trevor? <laughs> I mean, there's two a year now, at least. And, Sami uh, Zayn main events at WrestleMania. You can't take that away from him. I mean, it, it's still nice, but like, I mean, there's a reason he wanted that is because it was the one, like he, from everything in the podcast and stuff, he always talked about how he was a very goal oriented person. And the one thing he had not accomplished in WWE was that symbol of being the absolute top guy. Like, let's face it. They, they had anointed him as the number two guy in the promotion behind John Cena. And he was never going to be put above john cena just like people are never gonna be put above roman reigns no matter what right now yeah but, i've got bad news like, for him if he's going back to wwe and that's still his goal yeah i mean the closest you could get i, I think he probably thought was if i main event wrestlemania with john cena at least for that night even losing to him i'm kind of the one b to his one a and do you think that, that the, the miz got that role yeah yeah i mean and again, he he grew up. I mean, he grew up in an era where growing up watching WrestleMania, it was reserved generally in the era he was probably the biggest fan of for the top guys, usually. So that was the last box that he didn't get to check. Yeah, I remember him saying in the Coco Banna podcast, like he suggested, like, put me in 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 the, you know, make it a three way between me, the rock, and Cena, and I'll get pinned in five minutes and you can do the rest of the match. Like, I don't even care. I just wanted to be in that spot. Uh, yeah, he literally just wanted the historical significance of it. He didn't even care about like getting a shine from it or anything. This is kind of somewhat unrelated, but uh, someone mentioned it to me once. And do you think it bothers Punk at all that Punk was like this, his image in WWE in the last few years of his WWE and post WWE exit was always like, I'm the, the guy that's going to try to change the system. I'm going to make things better. I'm going to change wrestling forever. Um, and, and, and show everyone that like WWE's way of doing things is, is wrong. And the elite, his sworn enemies were the people who really like successfully started, uh, another wrestling company, obviously with the, that's because of Tony Khan, but the, the, the popularity of non-WWE wrestling was really launched, uh, in this country again by the elite and new japan pro wrestling coming in and kenny omega and punk you know had to wait you know a year or two to see oh the coast is clear it looks like this AEW thing's gonna make it okay now i'm on board and that for all of the talk and bluster of cm punk being this revolutionary figure in pro wrestling and he is to a degree the most revolutionary thing to happen in pro wrestling in the last 20 years is the creation of AEW. And that's largely because of the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. And do you think it bothered Punk that those guys basically did lived his gimmick while he, you know, sat on the sideline and waited until it looked like it was safe to join and then came out? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I think one thing that probably would help mute that if I was him thinking, trying to put myself in his shoes and his mindset would be, when he came to AEW, he gave them their biggest pay-per-view ever, their biggest, like, you know, some of their biggest attendances, all that things. So obviously not their biggest attendance now, unless you want to give it all the credit to CM Punk, Samoa Joe. But, like, he gave them huge numbers over and above anything the Elite had done. So, he, I think, what, however he feels, he can kind of comfort himself with the idea of, you know, 
I I took a, an, an important thing and I gave it like this extra jolt. And obviously that story now has a much more muddled ending. That's that's the one thing is his legacy now changes from I mean, that's the really fascinating thing, actually, when you think about from what we're talking about is his legacy has changed so much in recent years because it went from kind of the voice of disenfranchised fans for a generation to the point where WWE basically was able to move on and become more successful and kind of without having any more of those disenfranchised fans to this guy who I think when he came into AEW, the idea was he was going to be all right. To your point, I'm not one of the guys who started this really important competition thing that's kind of in some ways the next step of kind of some of my own ambitions, but I'm going to be the guy that pushes it to the next level. And for a while, it seemed like he was writing that story for himself and the company. And now that story, now instead of that being a long-term story, it's kind of just a blip. Like he came in, he popped business really big, things went horribly wrong. And right now, AEW... Their ratings are fine, at least Dynamite is. Um, their attendances are not good, other than the record-setting one they did in the UK. You know, it, it seems more like a blip on the radar, and I wonder if that would eat at him more than the Bucks did this, as much as all these things have transpired to now the... Ch if, if my story ends right now, my story, instead of being punk, like that cool rebel, punk, that guy who really changed things, it's more, more like... Punk, a guy who was a star who alienated a lot of people. Yeah, and that's that when we talked in our previous episode, that was something I always said was I wondered if that aspect of it motivated him in the sense of he flamed out of WWE. And then he looked like he he had flamed out of AEW and the last memory anyone will ever have of him is him in that press conference losing his mind and then getting in a fight. And I would think that he would look in the mirror and think about, do I really want to go out like this? Do I want my last thing in wrestling to be this, this rage? Um, and, and he came back with a chance to change that legacy. And if anything, he only cemented it further as being a malcontent that people don't want to work with. Yeah, it's, uh, Again, this is why all this stuff I go back to when people talk about, oh, he planned this, he planned that. I don't think, you know, that he planned to get fired, he planned to do this. I don't think Punk crafted any of this for himself. I think all the, I don't think he would have wanted his legacy to be in the place it currently is right now. I think, like we've kind of talked about, he just, he is who he is. And without thinking, he's reacted to things as they've happened, and it's left him where he is right now. I feel like it would make some people feel better if they think of this as, oh, this is just a crafted plan by CM Punk because he didn't want to work in the company anymore. Um, of course. P -p people, I mean, they say that's the thing about conspiracy theorists, right? Like, there's a comfort in believing conspiracy theories because it's more comforting than believing that crazy things can just happen, that you have less control in life. It's comforting to think that someone meant everything that has happened to happen. You know, if you're a CM Punk fan, it's more comforting to think he didn't just blow this up because he got angry for nothing. He blew this up because there's a better opportunity. He's going to go back to WWE. It's all going to be great. It's already lined up for him. And maybe, maybe it is. We don't know, but... It doesn't feel like it's already been lined up for him. All right. I think that's that's going to be it for, for tonight's episode. Um, Trevor, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Yeah. Um, I have my podcast through the years. That's THROH. We've covered basically everything CM Punk ever did in Ring of Honor, almost apart from like some minor pre-show things. But if I have a Patreon of, with a bunch of my rank. Basically, if you want to look up all my stuff, if you just go to my tw my Twitter at Trevor Dame, D A M as in Mother E. Um, there's, uh, if you go to the profile of my Twitter account, there's like a, a link tree and it has links to everything the podcast, the Patreon, some, a lot of my writing for free, everything. So that's your kind of, that, that's all the links you need for anything I've ever done. All right. That's great. And I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't had an episode in a couple of weeks. And my kind of goal here is, I don't really want to produce an episode unless I feel like I have strong content for, for the listener. And I like to think people appreciate that because, uh, Trevor, you're a pretty anxious person. Uh, do you ever have <laughs> anxiety that you have too many podcasts to listen to? Uh, yes. I, I, uh, in the last year, I finally reached that point where 
I have to accept I can't listen to everything. And it's really been bothering me, actually, because it used to be like, oh, I'll catch up, I'll catch up, I'll catch up. And I finally had to realize one day, like, I can't catch up with everything. Yes, you're just behind. It happens with like I'm behind on wrestling shows, I'll be behind on TV shows that I'm supposed to be watching that I'm not. Um, but the idea is like if I could post this, I want to have some sort of consistency with when I post these episodes, but I also don't want to overwhelm the listener with just all of a sudden more episodes are coming out all of a sudden because I am someone that likes routine and I have basically listened to the same set of podcasts for the better part of five or ten years and they come out on the same days and I kind of work my routine around okay when i'm driving to work on wednesday i can listen to this um and so i appreciate i think uh, uh not too much content coming out and overwhelming via the listener and yeah. uh competition of course in the space is, is very fierce but Absolutely. Uh, well I, I i i'm glad i could help you get another episode out i'm sorry that i could not help you with the quality content part yeah but you know we'll work around that that's yeah, okay. um, <laughs> there'll be a lot of edits to this. Yeah, it's uh, actually a five-hour record. Yes, yes. Uh, all right. Well, thanks a lot, Trevor, and thanks a lot to all my listeners. And I'll talk to everyone again in a while. Cheering at pro wrestling shows in Japan is back, and 2023 is already shaping up to be a big year in the history of pro res. That's why you should listen to the Emerald Flow Show. From the Royal Road to the Green Mat, Paul and Gerard take you into the world of all Japan pro wrestling and pro wrestling Noah. Not only do we analyze events, but we examine business, who is getting over, what angles are working, or not. Occasionally, we take a look at other Japanese promotions like DDT and Zero One. So if you're looking for more coverage of the world of Japanese wrestling, check out the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, available on all of your favorite podcast apps. Hi, I'm Case Lowe, co-host of the Open the Voice Gate podcast. The one question I'm constantly asked when it comes to Dragon Gate is how do I get into the promotion? Well, stop asking and start listening to the Open the Voice Gate podcast released every Wednesday on the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. For exclusive news and show reviews, look no further than the leader in Dragon Gate coverage, Open the Voice Gate.